Welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you uh, join us uh, today in this sunny Rome, uh, Italy day. Um, we welcome you to our webinar on Beyond Decision Making, Foresight as a Process for Improving Attitude Towards Change. Um, I think uh, this must be our ninth uh, GFAR webinar this year. Since generally we have covered um, a quite uh, a wide spread of topics ranging from building a bridge between scientists and communicators, uh, giving an introduction to the Tropical Agriculture Platform, the art and science of email-based newsletters, participatory communications, and how we can make communications in agriculture more a tool rather than a goal. We had a webinar on internal communications, uh, on participatory video, on farm radio and participatory radio. Uh, the previous one we did was on farmers' uh, rights and seed systems. And I think, um, uh, as I was thinking this morning, as I was preparing this webinar, each of these webinars had between somewhere 110 to 200 participants, with anything between uh, 50 to uh, 80 people um, simultaneously connected online and typically about 100 people watching the recording after the event. So if you consider the amount of time you, our online public, allocates to just attend the webinar, and the amount of time our presenters spend in preparing these webinars each time, for every webinar, it makes me nervous, hoping that uh, all will run technically well, and, it, and that it really adds value to you. So I'm, I'm really excited to um, start this webinar. And we cross our fingers that all of the connectivity and all of the um, um, gods of IT will be with us. Um, as any and all of uh, our webinars, this is a fruit of a collaboration between GFAR, the Global Forum on Agriculture Research, uh, the organizers of this webinar, and several of our partners and affiliated organizations and members of the GFAR community. Particularly for this uh, webinar, a big thanks to uh, Bunmi Ajilore, who pulled in uh, all of the other presenters. This really shows how GFAR works being a catalyst, and you are all the machine, while we at GFAR, the Secretariat, uh, are just the oil. Now, during this webinar, behind the knobs and the buttons, we have the sparkling and ever-smiling Emi Kio Wakira, who will technically manage the webinar. Emi is the white part communications uh, manager um, in the global unit here in Rome. Uh, y part being the uh, network of young professionals working in agriculture development and if you are under 40 and work in the larger agriculture work, work world and you are not connected yet to Y part you are really missing out so emmy will manage the slides and the technical aspect of the webinar my name is peter casier i uh, work in the communications team at the gfr secretariat they will be moderating your questions and i have the honor also of introducing the speakers but before we start, a, wor a word on the logistics of this webinar. For this webinar, we're all connected through a service called BlueJeans, which allows everyone to see the presentation and those speakers with a webcam. Feedback, tips, and questions should only be done via the chat box. So please mute your video and audio and keep it muted throughout the webinar. Otherwise, it will suck up a lot of bandwidth from everyone um, and we'll hear background noise from your offices, and all of that is disturbing and is uh, interfering with the presentations. Even though we are with a big group, we had um, 117 um, registrations for this webinar, I would still like the session to be as interactive as possible. So I do encourage you to send remarks, suggestions, and questions already during the presentations using the chat box, the, the icon of which you can find on the top right side of your window, after the presentations, we will have the Q&A session. Um, so when you have a question or suggestion that pops up in your mind, type it right in into the chat box. We'll monitor them, I'll aggregate them, and we'll go over through as many questions as we can during the questions and answers part. Now, after this webinar, I will send you a mail with a link to the recording of the webinar, um, a link to the presentations, and some links to websites or resources we might have mentioned during the webinar, or answers to questions we could not answer during the webinar itself. So now, <clears throat> without further ado, um, I would like to present the uh, program for today. Uh, we'll start off with um, uh, Bunmi Ajilori, uh, who works for the GFAR Secretariat, who will introduce the content of this webinar, followed by Tanja Hekert, um, joining us from South Africa. Tanja's talk will be on the benefits of scenarios and cover a general overview of foresight and futures thinking. Um, then we'll um, um, follow Tanya's presentation 
with Katindi joining us from Nairobi on the use of foresight for changing attitude. And then last and definitely not least is Robin Bourgeois uh, joining us also from South Africa. Uh, Robin will talk on how foresight can be used to improve attitude towards change. And then the last, of course, will be the Q&A session. Um, Bunmi, you can um, unmute your audio and your video. Um, first, as an introduction, uh, we'll have um, Aluwa Bunmi Ajilori, or Bunmi. Um, he is the GFAR Secretariat Foresight Advisor and the lead for the Global Foresight Initiatives. He has a, a specific focus and experience in participatory and collective actions and grassroots foresight. Before joining um, GFAR a couple of months ago, Bunmi worked with agriculture development and research organizations in Africa, Europe, and South America. His institutional experience spanned CTA, CIAT, CCAFs, YPART, and the Global Landscapes Forum Youth Program, as well as the um, Abosanjo Presidential Foundation. With diverse experience across regions, uh, brings a grounded locally and country-based perspective to foresight in agriculture and food systems, and for sustainable rural uh, livelihoods and landscapes. His, his experience has in particularly covered agriculture climate adaptation, agriculture and rural development futures, youth and ICT for the future. Bunmi, it's all yours. Please take it away. OK. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome once again um, to the um, webinar um, Beyond Decision Making, foresight as a process for improving attitude towards change. As Peter has mentioned, I will be making um, an introductory remark um, into the process of the webinar and the general overview of the, what the webinar is all about before handing over to Tanya. So in simple terms, for some of our participants who have limited background in foresight, I'll be explaining what foresight is. And like, as you can see on, on your screen, foresight is a term that is used to describe a broad range of works that try to look at or explore the future or what the future might look like. Um, let me go to the second slide, please. Yeah, but in relation to GIFA, which is the Global Forum on Agricultural Research, Foresight is seen as um, a multi-stakeholder and multidisciplinary and participatory um, 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 process in which we used to explore mid and long-term futures and to understand the drivers of change. So lastly, why this webinar? This webinar was brought together um, to look at how foresight can help improve agricultural stakeholders' attitude to change, to understand the most effective foresight methods to use when working with agri-stakeholders and farming communities, to talk about how agricultural and um, rural development stakeholders can transition from being preactive planners um, to being seekers and agents of change through foresight, and to understand the kind of incentives that can be used to facilitate this transition. Also, we'll be looking at the, what kind of skills and resources are required to enable agricultural stakeholders and farming communities to engage in foresight and be able to use foresight outputs to be able to, be, to catalyze change in their communities. And lastly, um, our speakers will be talking about what kind of what role can participatory foresight play in ensuring an inclusive decision making space for communities to participate in determining their own futures. And in addition to that, what kind um, what will be what role can development organizations play in catalyzing this process? So I'm going to be handing over now to Tanya to um, start uh, the presentation per se. Um, yeah, while I sign off. So Tanya. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Budmi. Um, uh, Tanya, you can unmute uh, audio and video now. Um, Tanya Hechert is uh, a leading uh, South African futures and foresight practitioner who specializes in uh, scenario planning, risk scenarios, uh, long-term strategy, and um, horizon scanning. She facilitates uh, strategic uh, conversations to assist clients all over the world in making sense of uncertainty, deal with vol volatility and complexity, and clarify the unfolding future. Uh, Tanya has an MBA specializing in strategy and forecasting and a master's in future studies, cum laude, from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. She teaches modules on scenario planning and global challenges to master's students 
and worked for eight years as a part-time senior research associate at the Institute for Futures Research at Stellenbosch University. More recently, she spends uh, time working in conjunction with the Center for Complex Systems in Transition, also at Stellenbosch University, and teaches systems thinking to MBA students at the University of the Free State. Tanya also serves as, this is a long uh, resume, Tanya. Yes, no, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> you can cut it short, Peter. You are welcome. Cut it all short. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost there. Hold on. I'm almost there. Now, Tanya also serves as a director for the South African node of the Global Futures Think Tank, the Millennium Project, and is a member of the Associate of Professional Futurists. Tanya is the leader of the Higert Associates and co-founder of Foresight for Development Platform. Tanya, it's all yours. Please take it away. Okay, hello. Thank you, Peter. Hello, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be part of this, so um, let me get going. Um, I'd like to start a little bit more broadly and contextually um, about how to think of foresight and how to use it, and not just in practical terms, but also as a way of dealing with change and uncertainty and specifically complexity. Now, I'm, I'm specifically not mentioning the word manage change because um, it might be misinterpreted. It's very difficult to manage, in inverted commas, complexity and, and change and uncertainty, but we can certainly do a lot better at coping with it. Um, and, you know, when we start thinking of agriculture and agricultural systems and farming, um, of course, it's, it's changed with a big C its complexity with a big C and its uncertainty with a big U. And, and that's really what the slide shows. It's a sort of a um, an acronym that is used fairly widely at the moment, that we're, we're living in a VUCA world, um, which stands for volatility, U, uncertainty, C, complexity, A, ambiguous. And the little definitions are there with it. Volatility is the speed and turbulence of change. Um, and, and we mustn't be sort of intellectually lazy by just saying, oh my goodness, there's more change now than there's ever been before, um, because that's very relative. You know, if you think of caveman and cavewoman, um, if a huge fire were to destroy the felt and they had no more food anymore, that would also be a huge change. Um, it's more related to the aspect of complexity. We really are living in and through more complex times. And, and that has to do with the number of elements that are interacting with one another and that everything that happens tends to affect everything else. Um, and then when it is very complex, this, this change starts exhibiting very different kinds of behavior, like tipping points, like things sort of exploding very unexpectedly um, or not in the literal sense exploding, of course, um, or things uh, declining very suddenly, tipping points, regime shifts in ecosystem services, and it's that kind of, that nature of change um, and complexity that, that we're living through right now. And, and we need to get a lot better at coping with that. Um, so uncertainty, of course, they, just to go back to the slide quickly, means that outcomes, even from familiar actions, are less predictable. Some things are always going to be somewhat predictable and we're very getting good with forecasting models. Um, and and modeling and so something like climate change modeling in the much further future we have a fairly okay idea of what is heading towards that but we're very bad in the sort of nearer term future um, and that's only when it comes to climate change many many other things into the further term future we really don't have a clue and then of course in in the forecasting and um world they like working with probabilities and things when you're a futurist and a foresight practitioner um, we sort of have the rule of thumb which says we don't predict uh, we rather work with sets of alternative futures and i'll say a little bit more about that in a moment complexity indicates the vastness of interdependencies in globally connected economies and societies and there's a slide about two or three along that just illustrates that concept and then of course ambiguity means that the multitude of options and potential outcomes resulting from them. It just means there we don't have good ways of knowing what are correct choices and outcomes going along with them. That sort of heuristic um, rule of thumb of um, 
be careful of unintended consequences or the future happens while you're busy planning other things that tends to kick in. So um, if you could switch the slide, please, Amy. Brings us to why is foresight and futures thinking useful? Oh, and just a little side note or a footnote, I guess. Foresight um, and strategic foresight, it's, it's called many different things all over the world, depending on where you come from and, and kind of what is dominant in that area. So um, Robin is, is French, so he will be used to the, the, the concept of prospectif. And if you are German speaking, it's Zukunftforschung. Um, many people like future studies or futures thinking. It's also called futurism, futurology. Um, but GFAR uses the terminology foresight and strategic foresight sometimes, um, which is a very practical, useful one and I think makes lots of sense. So foresight then is an inter collection, there's the inverted commas for definition, interdisciplinary collection of methods, theories, and findings. So it's ways of working with the future, ways of thinking of the future, and outputs that helps people to think constructively about the future. So not that the future is just something out there that happens to us, but to think more constructively. Um, and of course, at the heart of it is really to be able to work with the future and, and to use the future to be able to make better decisions today. And Romba, I guess you're going to be talking in, in about that in more detail. There's another little piece of quote. This comes from um, Jessica Bland and some work that she did at Nesta. We say it's the rigorous art of imagining. Um, so, you know, rigorous starts giving you an idea that there's some sort of science behind it, but it really is about the art of imagining to pursue the unknown. It's actively and consciously working with uncertainties and unknowns. And there's the, the, the very typical futures of foresight cone showing multiple futures is depicted as a flashlight. So imagine if you're walking in... Um, a dark forest or you're driving a fast car in the darkness, you need a set of lights to shine further so that you can get an idea of what's lying ahead. And the faster you drive or the faster you walk, of course, the further these this cone of light needs to shine. And as you can see there, that includes a prefer preferable future. That's, that's when you start doing sort of visioning work to figure out where it is that you would like to think things to go to. But that's very relative, of course, of course, who you are and who the other players are. Probable futures, a lot of forecasting work happens in that area. And then, of course, of course, plausible futures. And it's very it's very handy working with, with plausible futures. If you could switch to the next slide, please. Um, because I just want to touch on what is the most well-known, most useful, arguably practical, widely spread foresight and futures tool, it is scenarios. And I'm sure all of you have one way or another either heard of scenarios or worked with scenarios or seen the outputs of scenarios. So there are just some bullet points about what the benefits of scenarios are. Um, firstly, it's about innovative thinking. It helps us climb out of our own boxes and our own groupthink and our own sort of assumptions about the world um, because they explore intractable and undiscussed uncertainties. Um, you know, just as a little side note, uh, people love talking about the concept of the black swan, you know, something that is completely, utterly unexpected and has a very, very small chance of happening. And, and then after it has happened and you look at this thing and you say, oh my goodness, that was a black swan. Um, but it's sometimes it's a little bit more useful to talk about the concept, which is now it's gaining some traction, I guess, to call a, a black elephant, which refers to something that is actually very likely to happen. Um, it's got a high probability of occurring. It's just nobody talks about it. And there are a number of examples of, of those kind of things. Um, so those undiscussed uncertainties and encouraging broader thinking and countering groupthink. Scenarios gives us a shared language and very often we work with and we should be working with um, diverse participants, diverse stakeholders, many different perspectives, many different disciplines. Um, you know, gone are the days of where one expert in a certain area knows best and that if one implements X, Y and Z according to the expert, everything will work out fine. We're way beyond that. So scenarios help give us a language and create shorthand terminology that can be understood intuitively very often 
across and beyond organizations and topics and interest groups. Um, it helps give us gives us increased cooperation because precisely because it incorporates multiple worldviews across traditional language and cultural barriers and creates the potential to achieve fair process and deliver fair outcome. And again, referring to Robert, he's going to talk to some practical examples of how to do foresight and futures work in that manner. And of course, avoidance of costly mistakes. So it's just one little sentence there under that bullet point, but there's a raft of really spectacular work happening around risk management and how using the future and thinking of how things could turn out um, helps make you a lot more robust and resilient and um, helps you implement better, more rigorous decisions um, to avoid mistakes. So um, risk risk management is, is, is not really about only avoiding risk for which one has to look into the future and take multiple contexts and um, outcomes into account. Thanks, you can stay there, Emmy. Um, it really also helps one look at opportunities as well. So there's always the flip side of the coin. So just as an illustration here at the most basic level, scenarios help us explore alternative futures. So that futures cone that we saw um, gives us a sort of an idea of all the different kinds of alternative futures. Some people are doing some really amazing work on what is called preposterous futures, the completely unthinkable things. Um, but essentially, it's about examining, exploring those so that one reframes the present. Now, if you could just focus on the two sort of pictures there where we have a unilinear um, view of a person with one perspective, a view of the future, using a forecast, which is one path into the future and looking at one version of the future. Scenarios helps us to go into that, the, well, the graphic at the second row, which is we have and can consider many paths to different futures and at the same time hold different perspectives and a reframing of the present in our heads whilst doing that. And it just ends up um, giving you much, much better decision making. Uh, next one, please. And oh, there we go. Um, that is that is just um, again a, quite a visual sort of example of scenario work that was done in Malawi um, a, a while ago, um, and it was for the purposes of looking at at, at agriculture. It, it was to see what could the different futures of Malawi look like, and given these different futures for the country, how would that impact? Um, agricultural policy making when it came to taking decisions around climate smart agriculture. So agriculture that is adjusted for climate change conditions and also um, decreases emissions. So from there, I hope it's big enough on your screens, um, you can see one has these very typical axis of uncertainty that scenarios use. It's one method of scenario planning. Um, and we can see we've got one axis that looks at the nature of politics. So politics for the greater good. Um, and so this wasn't just meant um, because very often there's lip service to policy, to politics that is democratic and takes everybody in account. But then in reality, um, it can be very elite focused. Um, so what we meant with politics for the greater good, which is at the top of the Y axis, it actually means walking the talk. That polit politicians really meant what they said about the nature of politics. And the opposite to that is politics for the selfish few. Now, real life, in the present and of course the past and the future as well um, is, is moves on that axis. You know, it, it can sit anywhere between those two um, extreme points. And if one looks at the X axis, um, it has to do with the nature of the economy. So on the right hand side, a growing and diversified economy. Malawi, um, if for, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, has a very undiversified economy. 
um, and the opposite end of that, a stagnant and continued one-dimensional economy. And then if one looks at kind of any spot in those different scenarios, you would see we have four different futures, pictures of futures. Um, Kaka and Diuchi, that's, which is the land of milk and honey, honey, politics for the greater good, and there's a growing and diversified economy. And agriculture there would look remarkably different. Agricultural decision-making, agricultural politics, the consequences of the benefits of it, what it would contribute, what would be needed for it to grow, what it would contribute to growth, would look completely, utterly different to the exact opposite, which is in the lower left-hand corner, where you have Wotsalira, which is a stagnant and one-dimensional economy and politics for the selfish few. So what you can see here is um, the framing of different futures, and it's used to explore consequences and, and actions and choices and decisions in the present. And, and a bit of jargon is very often it's used for what is called stress testing or wind tunneling decisions in the present. Um, next one, please. And here, so scenarios is the one very well-known tool. The other well-known tool is horizon scanning. Um, so if you could picture a radar screen, and I'll show you a little picture of a radar screen in the next slide. Um, it's just about having a really good idea of what's coming our way out of the future. And, and not necessarily just events or trends, um, but how these actually interact and what could be the possible consequences of that. Now, I'm sorry that's a little bit blurry with the small print on there, but it's very easy to Google and it's a very handy illustration to, to keep in mind when you think about why it's useful to work with the future and with foresight. This is the World Economic Forum 2016. I think it's been updated. 2017 is out. Global Risks Interconnection Map. And what it basically shows us is how Things that happen in certain areas affect things then that happen in other areas and make it more likely. So that if one has systemic failure in an economy, for example, it would tend to have very big fallout in terms of agricultural production, economic issues, um, societal patterns. Um, it, it causes things that shape the future going forward for many years. And then sometimes those reach a kind of a lock in as well and create systems and, and um, unintended consequences of their own. And we're very bad at understanding things and getting to grips with things like that. So again, that is where foresight comes in very usefully because scenarios being the one tool, horizon scanning being the other really useful tool. If you could skip to the next slide. And it really just means, um, and it's it's for, horizon scanning has become, oh, sorry, it's, um, there's a little picture of a radar probably about in the next slide. Uh, we'll stick with ambient futures, futures, that's fine. Because the point I'm trying to make is that we need to get a lot better at using foresight tools um, to become more tuned into what the contextual environment is, is holds for any given domain. And in this case today, we're talking about agriculture, agricultural stakeholders, agricultural systems, particularly in emerging and developing countries. And because the future has been colonized already by many, many people. So, you know, if one just thinks of something like the land grab debates um, or, or issues or um, issues around genetically modified food or um, so those futures are being colonized by other parties already. So that's why this whole thing about using futures and foresight to empower decision makers becomes so critical. The point about ambient futures is that we are surrounded by futures. Ambient means it's all around us. And these pictures of the future are, so there are two pictures of African cities. Both hold true. But you know, what are African cities going to look like? Is it the picture on the left or the picture on the right? Um, or probably a mixture of them. And it depends on really a whole huge range of issues. And the point I'm trying to make with this, it's extremely useful, empowering, and I would argue necessary that one has a picture of a future of where you would like to go to, um, given your interests. Um, and of course, there's a huge, big, fat ethical element to this. Um, next slide, please. 
Ah, there eventually is the radar screen. Sorry, people, that was supposed to be about um, two ago. <laughs> but a very useful way of thinking about horizon scanning is just to, Im to imagine that, that one has this radar screen that you look into every now and again and, and have an idea of which blips are coming your way, whether they sort of super fast blips, whether they shocks to the system, things that happen elsewhere and then impact your decision making and your issues or whether it's sort of a more kind of a black elephant blip, that thing that nobody talks about um, or is hardly ever mentioned or is difficult to talk about. Um, and in, in Africa, for example, there are many, many such examples, the nature of governance, um, the capability of institutions, um, uh, data, the, you know, how, how good is the data that we're working with? Um, and and those, those things tend to be sort of unmentionable very often. So uh, using foresight and futures techniques and building a radar, radar screen and using the tool of horizon scanning can be very handy. I think I'm about to get to my last slide, which is kind of what which was, I was asked to address what skills and resources are required to enable um, agriculture and rural stakeholders to engage in foresight. Um, so I really just put a slide up which which shows there are an enormous amount of um, resources out there freely available on the internet. Um, it's, we, we really have, um, oh, Emmy, just click the rest of the button, sorry, because I made a build slide. Oh, there you go. And if we could just put all of them up, thank you so much. Sorry, I forgot that was a build slide. Um, there are many, many resources. You know, we, we're beyond the days where it's some kind of mysterious practice and you need fancy futures and foresight consultants. Um, the, so Foresight for Development, which is, which is a platform that I was involved in, has got an enormous collection of, of um, um, reading and work that's been gathered um, with specifically with, with an emphasis on development areas. Um, the, the blue block at the bottom is the IDS, the British IDS, Foresight Methods, a guide to easily accessible toolkits. And you, you'll note I'm not even mentioning the GFAR glossary here because that's also been produced. Um, and the orange block is what if the art of scenario thinking for nonprofits. So there's self-help tools and tie guides and things out there. And it really is a matter of just spending some, some time and effort on um, upskilling and self-skilling and um, and we can talk about this a little bit later but I, th I think where, where there is a will there is a way um, and and I fully believe and hope that that everybody should be able to do futures and foresight work to be able to take better decisions. Um, I'm done and my time is probably done as well if I'm not mistaken people. Oh, very good, uh, thanks um, for this uh, introduction into the, uh, the VUCA world. Um, uh, Tanya, um, um, Katindi, you're next. Um, so, uh, Tanya, you can go on audio and video mute. Uh, Katindi, cool. you can go, um, you can go uh, unmute your audio and your video. Now, um, Katindi uh, Sivignonio is the founder and the lead consultant uh, at the Longview Consult, a socioeconomic research policy analysis um, uh, foresight strategy and training firm that works with um, individuals. Uh, companies and governments uh, to understand possible futures that may occur in order to strategically help prepare for an uncertain and rapidly changing world. Now, prior to that, she served as the program director in an international organization that facilitates development dialogue. And before that, she was head of futures in a national think tank in Kenya. Uh, Katindi um, has, is a doctoral candidate at the Regent University uh, studying strategic leadership strategic foresight. She also has training in, amongst other areas, uh, scenarios planning from Oxford University. Um, part of her foresight work has included conducting scenarios um, uh, and exercises on the future of women in Africa, the future of social movements in Kenya, um, the future of the extractive uh, sector in Kenya, the future of energy in Kenya, the future of livelihoods in Kenya, and the future of CSOs in Kenya, and the future of youth in Kenya. All about the future. Katindi, it's all yours. You can also unmute your video, if you please. All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. My name is Katindi, as you've heard. And um, yes, I'm going to be giving you a more practical sort of like presentation about uh, what I think about foresight. And thank you, Tanya, so much for 
just giving us that um, conceptual sort of like side of foresight. So I'll start by just addressing the whole issue of um, foresight and how to use foresight to change attitude. And um, I think my first uh, point of call is just to say that for me, foresight is about learning, discovery, and reorienting yourself. So because of the kinds of people I work with who many of them haven't come into contact with foresight, I think for me, one of the things I pick up from their experience is that when you're using foresight, um, so when I'm, I'm, I'm talking to them about foresight, I normally sort of like make it a learning experience for them because one of the many things about when you hear the word foresight, a lot of people sort of like wonder what you're trying to do, whether you're palm reading or things like that. So I think the first point of call is basically to use very simple everyday explanations of what foresight is and also to demystify that concept. So, for example, I'll ask um, how many of you, for example, get a monthly salary? Um, how do you plan for your monthly salary? How do you anticipate some of the things that could happen in the future? And how do you prepare yourself for those eventualities? And when people begin to realize that this is something they do every day and unconsciously, and, and that that is a, a, a part of foresight for them, then they become more comfortable with the, with the concept of foresight. So I think that's an important way to help farmers um, sort of like begin to get into using foresight and to, into the habit of using foresight and just ex by demonstrating that they use it every day. I think the other thing that has been important is to also um, use case studies and testimonials and movies as well, depending on how much time you have, how the workshop is structured, to be able to sort of like explain further what foresight is. And um, for those who are listening, if anyone has seen the movie called Sliding Doors, and if you haven't, you could look up. It's an old movie, but it does show two sort of like um, experiences of the same people, the same characters in the movie and just different happenings. So this lady is going on a train and at some point um, in one scenario, she goes onto the train and reaches where she's going um, on time. And in, in the second scenario, she misses the train and she doesn't get on time and those two eventualities just getting onto the train on time and missing the train completely bring two different scenarios in her life and so that's another way of helping people to begin to imagine um, what foresight is and we can do that for for farmers as well the third um, point is learning through a variety of perspectives now when usually when we are discussing different concepts for example if we, we put farmers in a room and we are trying to discuss about the future of farming one of the in my view mistakes we make is to uh, put people of a similar thinking into the same room so you have um, farmers only and usually people of the same professional background or experience have a certain way of having a conversation and what that happens is that is uh, it introduces what we call blind spots in foresight so that you are speaking amongst yourself, you are speaking a familiar language, and you don't, in a sense, um, look at other things outside your field that that um, could add value to your conversation. And so one of the things that is stressed in, in foresight practice is to involve people outside your knowledge domain to be part of that conversation. So I'm imagining that if you have a, a farmer scenarios workshop, then you could include nutritionists, doctors, agronomists, politicians, policymakers, comedians. And as much as those people are outside um, that knowledge domain, they will say something, they have experienced something, or they look at that particular issue in such a different way that you would be able to get a learning perspective that would enrich the process and unlock or remove that blind spot that could be um, seen. And in that sense, you get a much richer foresight process that is able to be um, have better sort of like results in the future when it comes to planning. So that's another interesting perspective I have found in the work that I have been doing. And lastly, I think um, doing a trends analysis. And, and a lot of us, especially uh, foresight practitioners, are preview to the fact that you, you, you come across data all the time. But I think um, you can make that assumption with different people. When I have done foresight, and it's mostly with people who don't even know what foresight is, for me, the first starting point is to just make them aware of what has been happening in the past 
and what is happening in the present. And data has a way of bringing the conversations alive. So a trends analysis usually helps, but I must say that caution has to be taken so that people are not locked into those facts and figures. Again, foresight is not just about the static, what the static things that numbers say. Foresight is also about intuition, about learning, about perceptions. So you must take care that the numbers don't lock you into a fixed mentality. And that's an important point. So thanks, Amy, for going into the second slide. Um, and in this second slide, I'm going to be addressing the issue of um, effective foresight methods. And for me, um, I think there's no single superior foresight method. In, in foresight uh, practice, we normally say that there are no facts in the future. A lot of things could change. A small trigger here could, in a sense, alter a pattern that uh, maybe a, a focus wouldn't have picked up. And so one of the things we, we do is basically use different methodologies to enrich the process. And so I use both uh, statistically based um, models as well as intuition models. And I think the other thing to take into account is to understand the objective of why you're doing a foresight exercise. So for me, for example, to be able, like I said earlier, to understand the past and the present, I would use a trends analysis type or a horizon sc a scanning type. If I want to then move on into from that position to discussing the future, I tend to normally use the scenario story building process, which I'll explain um, and which Sonia, uh, Tanya has explained, but also I will emphasize in my next slide. And then when it comes to strategy building, of course, you take all those possibilities that could happen in the future and bring them to the present through a process we call backcasting, which is basically saying, OK, this is perhaps what might happen in the future. How do we move or not move in the present to be able to, in a sense, achieve or avert what we do not, achieve what we want to see or avert what we do not want to see? And then, of course, there's the elements of strategic planning that can help put precise actions to the, some of the strategies we want to pursue. So they are simple te techniques, but when combined, they bring out a very rich process. So we could go to the third slide. And um, in this third slide, basically, we're going to be addressing the whole question of um, transitioning. How do we help farmers transition from being preactive or from forecasting to uh, foresight seeking? I think um, one of the ways I have found useful is um, to, in a sense, show the value of why it is important or why foresight, I mean, why scenarios or that multiple multiple anticipation of the futures that could happen is more important or it can be more precise than using a forecast. So um, by showing that that type of what works and how it doesn't work, um, I think is a very good and the cost, cost and benefits of both methods is an important issue. And I'll take an example of, for example, um, the US case in, the, in just the last elections that they had. If you remember, Every practically, I think most um, news agencies, um, whether it's television, whether basically media, all of them anticipated through polling that Hillary was going to win. And perhaps it was informed by the future they wanted to see rather than what the reality was bringing out. Part of it is also the forecasting nature of polling that um, once you you just don't consider other things that are intuitive, for example. Um, people then didn't work very well with what if pre uh, President Trump became uh, um, the, 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 president, the president. And what happened is that the day um, after the elections, you had all these people with newspapers or magazines already con congratulating Hillary Clinton. And I think the important lesson here is it's important to have the different future so that you know, in case a particular future that happens, even if you do not want to see it, you're much more prepared about what would I do if, if a certain future that I wasn't sort of like anticipating happened. And so once people internalize the benefits and the costs of forecast versus foresight, they begin to get an incentive to change. And if you go to the next slide, I think one of the uh, illustrations- indeed. Sorry, so, can, can, yes. can I ask just a second? Can you put your camera a little bit lower uh, because we uh, we see only half? The, yeah, there we go. All right, oh, thank all you. Right. Please Sorry. go on. Oh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, go you on. were seeing my forehead, my forehead only. All right, so um, um, yeah, when it comes to the question of um, 
so illustrating the forecast. I used, for example, uh, for example, the weather. And when you look at the weather, for example, they'll say that in my country, um, they say July is always cold or it will rain in March and September, but that hasn't been the case. And the problem is, of course, there's the obvious example of um, uh, global warming and climate change. And so the point about forecasting, if you look at how this person is looking through that, they're using the past to, in a sense, discuss what the future will look like. But the point I think has been demonstrated many times that the past doesn't always continue in the future. And so um, the, the, the point about foresight here is that uh, of, of forecasting or the disadvantage about forecasting is that you're not, this, this type of thinking sort of like blinds you from seeing other things that have been going on that, that um, are probably making changes into the future that are not visible now. And so part of um, discussing the order that this slide is usually put up to sort of like bring out that, that, that disadvantage about focus. If you go to the next slide, um, and Tanya had this, although it, was, it looked a bit different, it helps us discuss, of course, what has been happening in the present and how it has shaped, uh, what has been happening in the past and how it has um, shaped the present. And also, I think one of the things that we miss out in discussing the present is the fact that the present also is seen from different perspectives. And, and that's a very interesting concept when we are discussing futures because a lot of times, and especially when you're talking to a group of people that are from a similar background, they, they might see an issue from one perspective. But again, like I, I said, if you bring different people, the, the current reality isn't one, but multiple current realities and multiple mental maps. And then scenarios helps you to look at the future in the different possibilities that could be seen. And I think Tanya did that very well. The red line basically is what I was talking about, the backcasting. So it's bringing these different futures into the present and asking, what would I need to do, for example, to realize the first scenario or the second or the third? What would I need to do to, to sort of like avert anything I do not want to see in the, in, in the future? Well, moving on to the next slide, I think uh, one of the things that um, is very interesting in, in foresight thinking, and I think for me this is one of the ultimate lessons for foresight, is the fact that a lot of times people make decisions based on the information that they have. And that information is basically informed by what we call an events level uh, type of information. So if you think about People make decisions, for example, about voting or about um, a certain issue based on what they've seen on the news. But few of us go to dig in what are the real issues, what are the patterns, what are the behaviors, what are the systemic issues. And so the iceberg analogy is a very good analogy to keep asking people to think through what are the systemic issues that need to be addressed in order to be able to shape the events. And in this case, we use the example of. Um, the the um, the Titanic, because um, of course the Titanic is about this big ship that was you know majestic and you know nothing could happen to it. But a really small and the the the, the sailor actually just ignored that that iceberg and said you know what this is a little thing this ship is mighty it can navigate this. What the sailor didn't know is or the captain didn't know is that there was something much bigger that could tear that ship apart. And it is the, 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 the iceberg underneath, the things that we do not see that are happening that are shaping the events. And so in the scenarios discussions, I think it's to understand and to unpack what are the systemic issues. And that helps us to understand um, what might happen or how it might happen and what that means. So for example, if you're thinking about um, something like GMOs, the GMO seeds, of course, there's a political sort of like narrative about we do not want this because we have no control. But what is the real issue behind GMOs? Is it world control? Is it political control and so forth? So unpacking those issues helps us to be much more prepared and sometimes much more pre uh, strategic when it comes to our engagement. Then moving on to the other slide. So once these issues, these conceptual issues are out of the way, then you need to convert this knowledge into 
a habit of anticipating the future. And I think um, you can, of course, you cannot do that in a workshop, but demonstrating that that is important is, is part of learning. But then um, the other thing is you have to then sort of like inculcate this practice by learning. And in the workshop, then, of course, we go on and start building scenarios. And so we, by doing this, they're, they're, they're learning and they're un trying to understand how foresight works or how to create the different um, futures that could happen. But then um, you need to demonstrate possible consequences and non of non-action or of action. So one of the things that I have found out when um, I've been doing scenarios is that, like when I did the youth scenarios, so I had a bunch of young, very um, sort of like young people who are not very hopeful about the future. But by doing the different scenarios, for example, um, just looking at what Kenya could become, you get people from moving away from that sense of delusionment to being very excited about the future. So that is an example of how you can, in a sense, help people um, see different perspective and, uh, perspectives. But also, again, the, the, the not so hopeful scenario then brings them back to their reality. But by demonstrating those, um, what could happen uh, by action or by different things that they could do to, to action what they would like to see, they begin to see as a way out, out to, outside their, their disillusionment. And so apart from sort of like helping people see different realities, it is a very powerful tool to help people, especially who are feeling like there are no choices out there. They are able to start seeing some sense of hope and in a sense, they feel encouraged that they can do something. And then more importantly, is to move beyond the foresight stories to then do real action. Because one of the failures of some of the scenarios processes I've been involved in, although they were very successful in um, demonstrating the future or in, in a sense, articulating things that could happen in the future, when we came back to backcast and to try and find solutions and strategies, a lot of the people responsible for it, like policymakers, were not ready to, to put in money or to put in time to create the policies that were needed. And so when the inevitable happened, then um, we went back and said, we wish we had put in more time in, in terms of, or more, more energy in terms of strategy. So it is not enough to create the futures that could happen. It is important also to go back and do strategy about, um, to action some of the things we would like to see. Then when it comes to skills and resources required, I think, Based on my experience and working with people who haven't really had a chance at the beginning to know what foresight is about, I would say that the real sort of like resource that is is required is much more a willingness to learn. And uh, that's important because like when I have worked with um, ministry officials, because of where they are at, because of the nature of their background as economists, they are very rigid to change. And, and um but when I've worked with ordinary people, they are so eager to learn. And, and that is a very helpful spirit if you want to do foresight work or to be engaged in foresight work. The second thing I have found that is very useful is time. A lot of people don't want to invest the time that is required to inculcate the, the practice and the discipline of foresight. And so that's the, you, it, has to, it cannot be a one-off. It cannot be a one-week's workshop, and then you move on and say, we did a foresight process with farmers. It has to take a time investment. And then the third point is that, um, of course, um, we need consistent tracking, especially of data, because that helps us to, to begin to see the different things that could happen. And we're not very good at that in, in Africa, at least. And then learning by doing, of course, constant um, sort of like doing different foresight exercises with the same group does help sort of like bring them into that, um, into that space of being better foresight practitioners. Then um, to my last slide. Yes, and so this is the, the role of participatory foresight, uh, the role that participatory foresight can play. I think um, the whole exercise has to include people from different spaces, like I said earlier, and it has to include all those time commitments and, and transformational in order for them to engage in the transformational nature of foresight. Then um, we need to improve the ability to participate in the ways their futures are 
determined. So in this sense, I was saying that um, a lot of people, especially um, I, when I think about farmers, I think about communities like in Africa where people, um, some of these farmers don't understand what is their rights, what are their responsibilities, especially in the policy space. So helping them understand that can help them feel empowered to action. But much more than that, I think um, one of the th important lessons that I have learned is that foresight, it's, it's okay to work with uh, people from outside a community. But I think I have seen it work better when a member of a certain community understands the, the, the understands foresight and is able then to work with people um, consistently to be able to, to engage in foresight. And I'll give an example of a process that was done in East Africa that was looking, it was called the CCAFS project, and it was looking at the nexus between food security, environment, and agriculture. Now, that process was a very powerful process and one that farmers needed. But then I, I, my analysis was that it wasn't very effective. It came out with, it brought out very powerful scenarios. But one of the reasons why follow through was not as good was the fact that, first of all, they, they got somebody who didn't understand the, con the context very well, the context in East Africa. I mean, they were a very accomplished academic, but the, there was a language barrier, there was a, a knowledge barrier. And, and so um, the, the, the policy makers and the farmers never quite understood because the person presented the scenarios in a very complex way. And so in my view, there was such a gap that people didn't grasp what the process was about. And so in that sense, it didn't effectively contribute to policy making in Africa. My sense was if, if the facilitator, for example, was someone local from East Africa, they would have sort of like um, contextualized the process more and they would have made it um, much more and simplified it better. And my point is very simple that when, and I'm speaking into the role that development agencies and organizations can play in facilitating foresight processes. I think, first of all, there's the whole question of, of course, working with communities, but with the aim of passing on this knowledge to the community to do it for themselves. And so training somebody and working with someone as an understudy for a long period of time would be very powerful in equipping them to, to become sort of like the person that takes on the baton and, and continues the process into the future after the official process is over. And I think, let me end my presentation there, but I hope it was uh, helpful. Good, thank you, Katindi. And, um... Uh, for sharing your um, your practical uh, experience on on foresight, um, and we'll continue with Robin. Um, Robin, if you can unmute uh, audio and video. Robin or Robin Bourgeois is an agriculture economist and foresight practitioner from the French Agriculture Research Center for International Development, um, uh, CIRAT. He is currently a senior scientist um, at the Center for the Study of Governance Innovation, Govin at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. So I'm going back to South Africa now. His current research focuses on anticipatory uh, governance, uh, rural development and empowerment. Before that, he worked at the Global Forum on Agriculture Research here with us in Rome at GFAR, strengthening the role of foresight and providing an open and multi-stakeholder space for dialogue and action on the future challenges uh, for agriculture research uh, for better development impact. Robin has a long practice of international organizations and experience of field research in numerous countries. His research domains include foresight, institutional change, um, inequality and poverty in rural development, collective decision making in the elaboration of public policy policies. Uh, Robin, do we have you online? Can you take it on? Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, after the uh, very interesting and, and uh, meaningful presentations from uh, from uh, Tanya and Katindi, um, I would like to uh, share with you some ideas regarding the five questions, uh, which are the core topics of this uh, webinar. And the first question is about foresight and attitude to change. Um, and the, the core issue of that question is how um, 
can it help to uh, change the attitude of uh, local stakeholders and farming communities towards change? Um, for me, uh, it uh, can help by making people, uh, by putting people in a situation uh, that's where they are able to use the future to sense and make sense of the present. In other words, um, it is about using the future to change the present, to change the future. So this is um, how I have started to work a couple of uh, years ago and um, have developed with uh, other colleagues an approach that I call collaborative scenario building, um, which intends to help people exactly to do that, that is use the future to change the present, to change the future. So how, how to do this, how you make it happening? Um, first, I would say it is about uh, moving the use of foresight, the use of the future, uh, from being an, an instrument, from being just a tool, and making it uh, an, an attitude, and particularly an attitude towards change. Um, for that, in the, in the past years, we have developed this, uh, this uh, approach, um, which is based on two core elements. The, the first one is to consider uh, futures literacy, the capacity to understand and explore the future as a capability, a, capa a capability that individuals and organizations could develop uh, and use as a part of an emancipation process. And that emancipation process is the second element of um, this approach that we have been developing. Um, the, the results of this process is, on one hand, having local communities and stakeholders becoming more confident in using the future and shaping the future by acting in the present. And at the same time, uh, having these people, local people, organizations, being able to use the future to uh, better understand what is at stake in the present time. In order to achieve this type of results, um, we built this approach on two um, key elements. One is considering the people who are engaged uh, in this kind of work, the local people, as doers, and uh, not just as users of some kind of foresight work which would have been implemented by, by other people. So really it's involving deeply the local communities and stakeholders in, the, in all the, the, the steps, in all the, um, the, the work that has to be done in order to properly explore the future and use the future. And we realized that an important element of this approach, the, this way of making people uh, being able to use the future to better make sense of the present was not to consider only the external forces uh, of the changes that could shape the future, but also focusing on what we call the internal forces, those elements that local actors can control or influence locally, and that would have a very important uh, determinant, determinating role in, in shaping their future. And for that, um, the collaborative scenario building approach that we developed um, enable local people to explore a diversity of what we call plausible futures, uh, different possibilities of evolution of their own situation, including desirable, desirable one, but also undesirable one. Um, concretely, this uh, approach has been implemented uh, when I was working at GFAR uh, through what we call the Grassroots Foresight Initiative. And um, we, we, we worked with farmers' organization, particularly in Asia and Africa. And in Asia, we conducted uh, uh, an approach which was a learning by doing approach where people from farmers' organizations were trained in developing and implementing collaborative scenario building at the field level. And you can see in that first slide the implementation of this work in three different areas, very local specific areas, the northern part of India close to the Himalayan border, and the southern part of the Palawan uh, island in the Philippines and the island of Flores in Indonesia. And you can see that by implementing this kind of approach through the uh, initiative and the leadership of these local organizations, a couple of things had changed since then. Um, and we had, we, we experienced, we witnessed very concrete um, progress and, and evidence 
of the capacity for these people to explore the future and become active agents of change. Amy, could you uh, go to the next slide, please? So now let's uh, go to the second question, which was about the most effective foresight method. Here, I would uh, deeply agree with, with Tanya and uh, Katindi. Um, for me, there is no foresight method that is more effective than any others in absolute terms. Actually, it depends very much on your objectives when you are engaging in foresight. And I just uh, give three examples here on different objectives related with different uh, approaches or different methods. If you want to engage, for example, with local communities in a more activist way, leading, taking them towards a desirable future, then there is an approach which is called visioning, um, which can be very well applied and very effective for that specific purpose. Now, if you are more uh, targeting some kind of policy formulation objectives with policymakers, for example, or decision makers, um, then you can use what is called the critical uncertainties approach. It's about building a matrix of, of contextual scenarios, and Katindi and, uh, and uh, Tanya uh, presented uh, some examples of this approach. And this is working well uh, when you are dealing with uncertainties and want to formulate some kind of broad policy orientations um, with, with decision makers. Another type of research of, of objective that you may have when you're engaging in foresight is a type of action research uh, where you would like to um, develop with, in, in a multiple stakeholder environments confronted to wicked problems, you would like to engage in a deep reflection with them about the options, the alternative futures that they might face and what kind of actions they could take regarding those things. And in that case, um, I'm using, for example, this approach that I call co-elaborative scenario building, uh, which is about creating a set of uh, internal scenarios, scenarios that people can locally influence and control so that they realize that they have a better uh, freedom and margin of maneuver to shape their own future. And these are only three um, examples. Um, I, more, more examples of objectives could be also linked with forecast approaches, etc. <clears throat> Sorry. Now let's move to uh, the third question about um, moving people from being pre-active planners to uh, proactive planners. Amy, could you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, well, here I think Tanya and Katindi already provided uh, very relevant clues and information regarding this question. Um, how, what we need to acknowledge is that the way people uh, use, people and organizations are using the future usually reflect the way those, the same people and the same organization see and understand the future. So, for example, uh, reactive planners would consider that the future, if I can say that, does not exist. They are just living in the present. They are just reacting to things that are, that are happening without anticipating uh, further in the future what might have happened. And I would say this is probably usually 80% of the normal behavior of decision makers, planners, uh, governance people. Now, if we look at how proactive people uh, consider the future, for them, uh, the future is unique, is, a, is, is linear, is the result of somehow projections of past trends and current situation. And for them, um, the issue is to adapt to what is expected to be uh, the future as a singular term. And for that, they will uh, develop some kind of uh, plans that will address the issue that, the, that they are considering are coming to take place in the in the future. Now, being proactive is having a different posture, a different attitude where you consider um, that the future is not unique, that there are many futures, and you have a capacity to do something about it, to influence uh, the happening of these futures. So basically moving from being preactive to proactive requires also changing the way people see the future. And this is probably our tasks as foresight practitioners who 
believe in the plurality of the futures to raise awareness among um, populations of decision makers, policy makers, local stakeholders, that the future is not unique. And of course, we have ways to do that, as Katindi and, and Tanya already mentioned, there are a diversity of approaches that can be used for that purpose. And here, this slide is just a, a, a reporting on an inventory that uh, I did a couple of years ago, um, where uh, you can see who is engaging in uh, the initiative for foresight. And there is a majority of international government organization, regional organization, and government organization, while civil society organizations are much less represented. And, and this is not a, a kind of neutral situation because these different organizations carry uh, their own perception about the future and they will shape the way people will look at the future. This is why um, also uh, the idea of empowering a different, different types of, of organizations or people in using the future is a key element for moving from a pre-active to a proactive uh, situation and particularly uh, leveling the playing field when where people who are not yet uh, in a capacity to use the future get this capacity and, and become key actors. Amy, can we move to the next uh, slide? The next slide is uh, about skills and resources. And the question was, uh, what skills and resources are required to enable agriculture and agriculture and rural development stakeholders, farming communities to engage in foresight analysis and becoming catalyzers of change? So for me, this is a process, as I already mentioned in the first slide. And that process has at least three uh, components. First, you need to have somehow a clear and conceptual posture about using the future. Why are you engaging with people in, in using the future? And as I explained in the first time, my own posture is to consider using the future as, as a behavioral approach, as a process of emancipation and futures literacy as a, capa as a capability. Now, once you have that in, in, in clearly in mind, how do you make it happen? Um, in terms of skills development, uh, Katindi and Tanya already mentioned that also. It's really a learning by doing process. It's about, it's, it, it goes through practical training. As you can see the picture here above um, on the right side is a, is, a, is a capacity building workshop that we developed in Nepal uh, uh, concerning the future of forest community and tenure security in, in, in the region. Um, but then once you've got that people in, in a capacity to implement, to do some foresight work, um, then you need to act immediately, if I can say that. Go from the, from the practical training, from the learning by doing, to the implementation process. And that implementation process has to be driven and led by the same people who were trained, not by those who uh, trained them. Uh, so that's why I call this immediate practice through real field implementation by local actors. Um, and once this has been done, uh, then you need to take a little bit of time also to reflect and revise eventually uh, your conceptual framework and your training approaches based on the, uh, the outputs and the, learn the lessons that you've learned or that the, uh, the, the, the people who have been trained and implementing this work have learned and, and shared in order to improve and continually make this approach evolving. So in short, it requires a combination of conceptual elements regarding the philosophy and the ethics of using the future, some practical training through learning by doing, and immediate practice uh, through real field activity. Um, let's go to the next slide, Amy, please. The next slide is the next question is about um, the role of participatory foresight for ensuring inclusive decision making uh, for rural communities. So th that question for me is a bit uh, a redundant question because if you are engaging in participatory foresight, then it means that you consider that inclusive decision uh, making is is the objective. So somehow the two things are, are, are almost similar. Um, now, if I, my, my feeling is that the main, the gap, the, the, the main obstacle uh, from that, that, that makes it difficult uh, moving from 
uh, engaging in foresight and developing actions, making decisions and acting. Um, it's, it's something that is related with um, the transformation of a capability into agency. And probably it's not just something that is uh, specific to foresight. Uh, it's, it's, it, it happens everywhere in any kind of development project. And this is because when you are engaging in that kind of, of activities where you want to uh, help or, or support people in, uh, in an emancipation process, in building capabilities and using them, you are facing um, the implementation problem, the action problem, um, because there are several factors uh, which influence and condition the possibility to turn that newly acquired human capability into human agency. So I would say uh, a, a key role for organizations who really want to uh, help people using the future to change the present and then change the future um, has to combine at the same time uh, a, a facilitation process for acquiring this uh, future's literacy capability and at the same time reduce uh, anticipate and reduce the obstacles the constraints that these people uh, would uh, or are likely to face when they will use this capability to turn and turn it into action so basically and concretely that means that those organizations supporting this kind of approach would need not only to support the development of skills and new attitudes of the of the people towards the future, but also they would have to work on the institutional, the local institutional arrangements and habits of behaviors, which might provide either an opportunity or obstacles for the implementation, the transformation of this capability into human agency. And um, of course, this would require a transformation of whoever uh, is supporting this kind of approach because it means that they consider themselves, I mean, the, the organizations themselves, they have to consider the future, not just as a strategic element for their activities, but really as a process of empowering uh, people and building capacity. If we can move to the last slide, please. Um, this last slide is, okay, it's in French, I'm sorry for that. Um, it's something I'm, I'm using right now uh, as a kind of conceptual framework for uh, um, shaping the way I see the use of the future, the use of foresight as, a, as an element, as a key element in the process of institutional change. And I'm not going to develop the slides, I'm just saying that I see it in, as a two-way process. Uh, first, um, we need to address how individual habits transform the structures. So how would, would be the role of foresight in changing the, the, the propensities of, of the people, the behavior of the people, and that would be transform, transforming also the structures, the institutions in which they are working. And at the same time, we need to use uh, foresight as a way to transform the structures working at the institutional level so that the, the, the institutional uh, settings provide a better environment for people to uh, change their attitudes and use foresight uh, as, as a kind of way of uh, looking at uh, the room for maneuver they have in, in order to become agents of change. Um, and I'm applying this, uh, the conclusion, I'm applying this um, right now to a, a research project, a collaborative research project that I'm developing at the uh, Center for the, for the Study of Governance Innovation here in Pretoria, which is a project uh, about the futures of governance and the governance of the future with a strong focus on territorial development, so the development of uh, rural areas, particularly in, in Africa. So I guess this is the end of my, uh, my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, Peter, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Good, uh, Robin. Thank you very much. Um, joining uh, us from uh, Pretoria, um, with covering the uh, the basic uh, ingredients, I think of foresight and sharing some of the um, the work that you did in India and the Philippines and Indonesia. Uh, we're moving over to our question sessions with questions and remarks that the audience have um, added in the uh, chat box. If you haven't added a question yet, now is the time to do it. 
Um, I, we have a number of questions already coming in, and quite a bit of the, the questions uh, are related to the link between foresight and policymakers, foresight and um, uh, government. Um, um, a, a practical uh, question relating back again to the world of, uh, of technology, uh, Dan Boom, um, and um, this is coming your way, uh, Tanya. Uh, Dan Boom says, um, uh, I think there is uh, nothing more complex uh, than to uh, project tomorrow. It's, it is distinguishing trends, uh, it contains a lot of data, uh, you need to have a gut feeling and above all you need to have a leader, and that's where the question is coming to, uh, you need to have a leader uh, who believes as, um, the certain trends. Um, I remember the words, he says, uh, of Ken Olson, who was then um, somewhere in the 80s, 90s, the CEO of DEC, a thriving IT company, and also said, uh, who wants to have a PC at home? He simply did not believe it would happen and didn't make resources available. So as a result, DEC, um, even though there was a clear foresight, a clear prediction of the role of PCs in people's homes, uh, DEC as a company um, went um, uh, uh, belly up and is now on the graveyard. Another example is Nokia and the, the lack of foresight. He relates it back again to his work um, uh, or um, the work he's connected to in the Philippines coconut projections. It is projected that eight to 10 years uh, from now, uh, the yield will go down because the trees are getting older. Replanting is needed now, but there is no belief uh, in agricultural um, uh, levels at uh, the moment, neither that um, uh, action needs to be taken now, the replanting of, of the trees. So uh, Tanya, the question of, uh, uh, for you is, relating foresight and uh, foresight predictions and bringing this back to the people who are in power of taking decisions very often it comes back again to the person who needs to take that single person needs to take that decision hello. doesn't believe hello, hello and, I'm, here. Um, I'm here okay um all right uh, robin can i just uh, get uh, pitch this question to uh, to tanya and then i'll come back to you for your presentation um uh, robin uh, go ahead tanya I'll be very quick um, so that, you know, while we've got Robin, we can make use of him um, in case there is a problem again. Um, Dan, yes, I, I saw that little bit of chat. Um, of, I saw your question in, in the chat box. Um, of course, it's a very complex issue. Um, and there's no pr proper answer for it because in some cases, in some situations, we have a context where if a senior decision maker, a policy maker, or somebody who has agency and power to be able to change things and, you know, say, okay, that's it. Uh, we are now going to spend time, money, and energy on planting new trees, uh, even though it's got a short-term cost associated with it. You know, if one has the situation where that happens, it's as easy as trying to get buy-in for someone to realize um, future implications. And there's this fine, fine line between, you know, what is forecastable and what isn't forecastable. With something like coconut trees, yes, you know, we know the trees need to be replanted. Um, but I'm afraid real life very, very often doesn't work like that. Um, and, and we're seeing, you know, even in sort of um, advanced, in inverted commas, um, industrialized modern societies, you know, the Western Europe, the United States, those kind of places where, where policymakers who, who do know things or are supposed to know things um, don't actually get around to implementing anything and and it's because and it brings me back to that point of of complexity you know if, if there's a world view that if if people had better information and better knowledge and was better able to convince other people to forego short-term gain to be able to take better long-term decisions it really would be as easy as that but unfortunately it isn't um, and then I really do speak from a perspective of wearing my African hat. I, I do. I, I live in Africa. I work in Africa. I do a lot of um, futures work in Africa and things really are very complex. And, and we're surrounded by wicked problems where um, I think I mentioned the Malawi example. You know, politicians pay lip service to decision making, to policy making, to um, science that informs policy to all sorts of things, whereas in reality, it, it, it really is a swamp of things happening. 
Um, and, and I think Robert is going to speak now, right now, about the importance of, of how futures and foresight can be empowering um, for people where one takes a more egalitarian worldview of, of issues. So I'm sorry, I haven't answered that question at all. I've just mumbled on a bit further about the complexities <laughs> of things. But but I, I think I'm kind of trying to say in a straightforward way, Don, Don sounds like he might be a Netherlander, so I can be straightforward about this. Um, it, it is, it, it, in an ideal world, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, to, to just get people to, to, to take futures information and use the future and take better decisions today. Um, but unfortunately, it really never is that easy. Uh, Tanya, um, uh, I'm coming back again to, um, uh, to you um, on um, the link foresight um, um, policymakers, but then specifically on government. Um, and there were a string of um, messages and uh, questions and remarks um, that take the example of climate change um, and, um, uh, and foresight. I think climate change would be probably a school example uh, where um, foresight was done in a scientific way, in a quite elaborate way, uh, done by multiple, multiple disciplines and organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, but probably we run against um, trying to sell this towards um, uh, uh, either policymakers, although in quite a bit of, of countries, probably policymakers have bought in uh, into the science mm -hmm. of climate change, have seen the trends, and do also um, um, understand uh, the next step as to what we need to do um, to um, um, uh, deal with the um, economics and science um, um, and technology uh, of um, um, mitigating climate change. But still, we're faced with politicians that work on a pretty short term. Uh, term. And um, things like what we work on on foresight and typically climate change um, are things that are 10 years from now, to, um, 15, 20 years from now, way beyond the um, political mandate and the political term of, um, of government. So the question is, um, how can we, um, what would be the way that we as a foresight practitioners um, can make sure that not only policymakers, but also people who are in government um, can take on the recommendations mm -hmm. and the things that need to be done? Um, gosh, Peter, okay, thank you. Complex questions again. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you know, if if foresight were a silver bullet and an easy answer and a recipe for how to solve some of these complex, wicked issues, um, it, it would it would make it far too easy, wouldn't it? Because then, you know, then we could all just become um, spend all our time, money, and energy saying foresight is the way to do it. Um, but it, it doesn't work that way. And, and it's also not the only way. You know, there's some people that, that will argue it, it's as important um, to start advocating for cultural change, um, you know, to, to make people on the ground that vote for politicians r realize um, the enormous danger and, and crisis we are facing as all of humanity um, regarding something like climate change. So. I think foresight is is one of of many approaches out there. Um, I mean, so we're having a webinar about foresight and, and futures, and and people like Katindi and Robin and I work in that area. Um, so, you know, yes, we we're going to turn around and say, absolutely everybody, not just countries and political leaders, um, should become a lot lot more aware of. Um, how to use the future, how to actively work with the future, how to be future literate, you know, like one is numerically literate. Um, how, how does one become futures literate? Um, and, and, and that doesn't mean that, that you then advantage your idea of what you think is good and right, because remember what's good and right for a good climate in Sweden is, is maybe not the same thing what is good and right for a good climate in South Africa. Um, but, but to work with the future in, a, in an open way that, that gives us more options and more opportunities and possibilities for taking some very, very critical decisions. And, and, and then having said that, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little skeptical because, again, it's this whole thing about paying lip service versus actually working actively and shaping the future for a better word. And, and the lip service, I mean, show me one country that doesn't have, I mean, unless it's some really awful place, but show me a country that doesn't have some kind of long-term plan, you know, so 
Kenya 2030 or South Africa 2040 National Development Plan or it's it's there on the books for every single country but the gap between what those kind of plans state and the realities of um, current pressing concerns and decision making and paying lip service to something and actually really taking decisions um, uh, it's a huge, huge gap. You know, we've, we've got, again, we've got a rule of thumb is that two years before an election and two years after an election, no decision making happens because, you know, politics, uh, politicians are busy um, <laughs> um, preparing themselves for the for the first election. And then afterwards, you know, sort of rescambling and resetting two years after the election. Um, so it, it, it goes back to the systemic wicked problems that we have. Um, with with government governance systems and political systems and and climate change and economics and everything is kind of woven into it. So, to me, we we really do need different ways of thinking and different ways of doing. Of which, someone like me would argue, um, actively using the future and becoming future literate is is one of them. Um, and then uh, I guess and then just to add a little footnote to this answer of mine whilst hoping Robert up and running again at some stage, um, is that there really is some amazing futures work being done right now at government level, at state level. Um, one thinks of Dubai, uh, the, the United Arab Emirates. One thinks of work being done in Singapore. And skeptical people will immediately turn around and say, yeah, but it's easy for them to do because, you know, they're sort of kind of smaller city states and things like that. But there's active decision making and a lot of energy and and money and brain power being spent at looking at at post oil economies and and singapore you know their security situation and food security situation there's a lot of active futures work happening at state level that's really really good work um but but then you know the 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 realities of of real life with a big r come come into play and and people like Donald Trump get voted into power and and unpredictable stuff constantly happens um so so yeah um, futures and foresight is is not a is not a silver bullet it's it's not a recipe um but it i think it's it's one of a of a set of tools if i may use the word of of thinking and doing differently, which which is desperately needed, uh, given given where we are right now as humanity on planet Earth, and we're going through a huge transition and and transformation into a future that's going to be very very different from from the one that has brought us to where we are now, the past. Thanks, uh, Tanya. Um, I think Rob, Robin is coming back uh, online. Uh, Robin, just a second. Um, let me um, switch it first to uh, Katindi. Katindi, do you have anything to add on this? Um, of course, you've concentrated in your talk on um, um, on, on the practical uh, issues of, of foresight, um, and this is a larger political um, uh, issue. But you touched on this uh, also in your presentation. Do you have anything to add on the link uh, foresight and governance policy? Go ahead. Yes, I was going to say that one of the processes we did in Kenya was to look at the future of Kenya. And of course, that was mainly tied to what policy makers were going to do to make um, that future better. And they didn't listen. And then the inevitable happened and we had a conflict in 2007. And it's interesting how we moved as a country from not wanting to engage with foresight and actually being um, sort of like... Um, <laughs> um, what can I say, um, getting into trouble for it, into being requested constantly to help with scenarios process at the policy level. And for me, what changed and that transition to help policymakers start sort of like using or at least being endeared to use foresight as a useful tool was the I told you so story. So um, using that in a sense to uh, to vindicate that, look, this this is something that had been looked at before. It has come to pass. Had we done something about it it could have happened i think was one way kenya used to sort of like start using foresight at the policy level but i think the second thing when it comes to um things about um um when it comes to climate change one of the things that i think is an issue is first of all the fact that some of those foresight processes are very complex and the results are very complex just by the mere fact that because their the, the, the basis is in science 
And I think, um, and then they're very alarmist and a lot of them tend, tend to be Western models. And my point is that I think there's a place for balancing hope and, 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 um, and the alarm so that um, um, people tend to get paralyzed when there's all too much alarm and less hope. So one of the things that I have learned from the processes we've been doing is just balancing between the scare stories and the hopeful stories. But secondly, contextualizing the issue. Thirdly, simplifying the findings so that people feel a sense of, of the fact that they can engage and it, it is something that is in a sense um, they relate to. But lastly, the fact that one of the things I have learned through the processes I have done is a balance between, um, a first of all, understanding that government is inherently political and that policymakers are also very political. And so balancing the messaging that you're giving with um, political interests and seeing how can you leverage that so that, um, and they become more responsive when in a sense they see a political interest that they can peg onto. And that's really my simple answer to some of the issues we can do to get policymakers a lot more interested in foresight. I'm switching back again to Katindi. Uh, Katindi, there were a couple of questions that um, uh, came uh, for you, uh, which probably were instigated by you mentioning um, the um, uh, ways that, um, or the challenges, I think it was with one particular uh, project in Eastern Africa, um, the challenges that that project had to engage the, uh, the community. Now, uh, the first question for you would be, what would be your practical tips in making sure that foresight knowledge uh, and, and research related to, to foresight are really adapted to the local community? Go ahead. The practical tips. Um, practical tips. So, all right, I think the first step that I have found useful is for people to, um, to get, for example, if it's research or a study that has been done on foresight, um, to remove all the jargon and make it as simple as possible, make it as relevant as possible to the context of the people. So, for example, when um, I've done a foresight exercise, let's say, on the general future of Kenya, if I go to a part of Kenya that is pastoralist, I would still, for example, um, be able to disseminate the work, but use more examples that are relevant to that pastoralist community than the general issues that are captured in the foresight in Kenya. So contextualizing the process has been very, very useful in terms of uh, trying to teach foresight to ordinary people who otherwise don't engage with these conceptual issues or don't even have the ability to use the conceptual issues of, um, of foresight. I think um, I mentioned earlier that um, also beginning with um, examples of what foresight is, because foresight tends to be such a huge word. So also breaking down what you're trying to do or the objective of the work usually helps people to also catch the issue better. So that um, they are also, because one of the things that in our context that has happened is that when you say you do foresight, a lot of people expect you to predict the future, which is not the case. So trying to, being very clear about the fact that you're giving options and that the idea for those options is for us to come and plan and to be able to strategically engage, I think is very important. But also um, it's one thing to create stories because a lot of people then ask me, then what? So it's to make the foresight exercises as user usable as possible, as usable or user friendly as possible. And so by saying that you want them to be user uh, to be usable is to then uh, move from not only creating the foresight exercise um, to coming back to saying what can we practically do as a community and and uh, how I structure those foresight conversations and what I have seen work is to identify what different groups of people can do. Because a lot of times communities tend to point fingers at, oh, that's the work of the policymakers, that's the work of government. But it's in a sense coming back to say, what are the practical, how can I practically take responsibility for those foresight mechanisms? And I think when, when I have structured it that way, I have seen people appreciate, like Tanya says, and uh, like Robin says, the complexity of foresight, but also actualizing it um, is, is becomes very important. People own the process and people learn, are able to, to engage with the process in a much more meaningful way. Okay, thank yeah. you. Can I say um, something, Peter? Can I say ahead. something? 
Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, um, I just want to uh, to make uh, a po two points. One is about the universality of uh, the use of the future. I have worked in many places, uh, from Peru to Indonesia. I have worked in a village in the in the Amazonian Gu French Guiana, in a village of 57 people. Uh, we did this uh, collaborative scenario building in a language that is spoken by no more than 300 people in the world, the Guayana language. Um, so there is there is a pos it is not something that is reserved for an elite or for some kind of very highly intellectually developed people. It is something becoming future literate is a possibility for anybody, everybody in the world. And the second point is um, there is a, a, a vocabulary problem when we are using uh, the, the two words foresight exercise. Um, if you have heard me well, I think I never use the, the combination of foresight with exercise because this is undermining, this is uh, the, 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 the value of what we do in foresight. You are not talking, when we are talking about a foresight exercise, it's just like something that we are trying, but it doesn't, it's not very important. It's just an exercise. Um, no, it's, it's a reality approach. And I've seen in the chat that some people said it is not very different from other approaches, development approach. This is true. It is not different from any other development approaches. The only thing is that any other development approaches, you never call them exercise. So why are you calling people, uh, why are we calling foresight exercise? Think about it. <laughs> yeah, actually that ties in <laughs> with the question that we had from from Jenny, who uh, called it uh, probably it's it's by lack of uh, uh, Robin. If you wouldn't call it a, a foresight exercise, what would you call it? A foresight project or um... initiatives? I'm always using the word initiative. Local foresight initiatives are are um, it's really it's really something that. Uh, changes the perception. If you call it a project, then again, it's something that is short term, that is conditioned by uh, who pays for it, etc. Um, of course, it depends very much the type of foresight you are doing, how you use the future, with whom, and what is the purpose. In the work that I'm developing, usually um, we, we go beyond the idea of the those who are asking for this work, um, uh, who think about it as a kind of pilot project or a pilot experience, etc. Usually it engages so deeply the, the people who are working in that initiative that it goes much beyond the, the concept of an exercise. Correct. Okay. Um, um, I would um, like to give the, give the microphone back again um, to uh, Tania. Tania, there was an online discussion in the chat channel um, with Jenny where Jenny said, uh, well, the foresight initiatives mm. uh, at, at community level uh, will need to take into account uh, of or mm. analyze possible conflicts and power struggles, identify potential synergies, areas mm. for cooperation, and agree on uh, trade-offs. And probably that's uh, more on the uptake of, of the, the foresight uh, work. Uh, you want to uh, elaborate a little bit on that discussion? Um, because Jenny asked, uh, could the speakers please explain how they address these different interest groups um, and their different <laughs> needs and power relations within the community, um, and how specifically they, they can address gender. Uh, go ahead, Tanya. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, th thank you, absolutely. And and I'm going to ask that um, R Robin and, and Katindi um, are part of this conversation as well, because, um, you know, we've, we've already run into a, a little bit of a, a thing there, and, you know, where, where do you call it a foresight project, or is it a, a, an initiative or an exercise, etc., with, with Robin making that very important point um, th that has to do about, about I'd say the the level of depth um, one one works with a specific community where where absolutely all these issues uh, and and what the culture is and all those issues come into play and and are part of the mix. Um, and and the point I was trying to make is that that foresight isn't much different than than other development interventions. Um, you know, if one does everything from, uh, you know, who who decides what projects are a good idea for whom, why, and who pays for it, you know, you you immediately bump up into those huge issues about um, 
who is empowered and and who isn't and and how how do things work on the ground and very often development organizations you know pile into these things w without knowing um a, a lot of this stuff um and and I mean, I'm I'm on very shaky ground here because um, you know I'm not a I'm not a development agency person at all. Um, but having said that, um, a, a lot of foresight and futures work constantly happens. So the work that Robin does and and what he was telling us about is is very much an ideal, and 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 that is and that is how this work should and must happen to really truly empower people um who who have skin in the game um the reality is that foresight and futures work and forecasting work and gets done by a myriad of different agencies um whether it be governmental business um non-profit you know for for good intentions or um just it it gets done all over the place by 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 many many people, um, and and then if one looks at the whole of all of this work that is happening, um, every aspect of it from from how participants get chosen to be part of a of a of a workshop in looking at the future, you know how the facilitator of that of that workshop, you know who who gets to speak. Um, and and how loud are their voices, and how tuned how attuned is the facilitator to 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 the sort of the underlying issues in the room? It it becomes, and then if you if you disseminate the work, you know how does it get disseminated to whom? Who is able to reach it? Um, it 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 it's it's absolutely fraught with with difficulty, co constantly, and and I mean. As a rule, in my experience, there's very much an element of um, elite capture of of um, foresight projects and exercises, and but but it's 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 there with with many many other issues and 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 development projects and things as well. I mean, you know, if, one, if we're speaking agriculture and we're speaking Africa, you know, maize is a political crop in 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 countries like like um, Zambia and and Zimbabwe and and Malawi. And you know, development agencies often praise the idea that that subsidies are given to farmers or whatever, but you know, subsidies are given to certain farmers. It's 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 so it's it's an absolute minefield going in there. So so Robert and Katindi, please help. I don't know whether you saw Jenny Jenny's um comment on um on the on the in the chat box. And I guess the point I was trying to make is that um there there is a distinction between I think foresight practitioners and and good foresight practitioners. And and I think there is an ethical dimension to this. And I think good foresight practitioners would do their utmost best to at least be aware of the issues and be sensitive, sensitized to the issues and to the best of their ability, keeping in mind that foresight practitioners are not the people who control um, the, the the funding or, or control what the output should be or who the output should go to or whatever, um, but always to the best of their ability, um, be, be, be sensitive to and raise those issues and, and take them into account. Um, yes, uh, please help. <laughs> <laughs> Katindi, um, I, 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 um, I switch it over to you um, and then yes. maybe with the practical example uh, of methods that you have used to engage the typically marginalized uh, part of the community, which are women who are often silent in, in public spaces um, for social or cultural uh, reasons. Um, so how can we how can we engage them? Go ahead, Katindi. Yeah, I think, um, I think my experience has been that you need to manage the process at very different levels, but all of them culminate into a successful process. So um, from the beginning, when when a client, for example, comes or an, a foresight exercise is beginning, um, people tend to have, and especially people who are not in the field of foresight, tend to have a, a sudden way of thinking about who they want to involve and what they really want the outcome to be. And I think it's important from the onset as a foresight practitioner or as a facilitator to, to be very clear about what a foresight process is. A foresight process is inclusive. And, um, and at that point, um, so that if the process is designed to exclude certain people for certain reasons, if you don't manage the politics at that point, 
then the whole process is flawed right from the beginning. And so um, from the onset, you manage that, that type by being very clear and very forthright about who has to come into the process. I think the second thing is also this thing about managing um, the outcome because um, foresight processes are also about discovering. Remember, nobody has answers to the future. And unlike other processes that are meant to have a certain outcome, the a foresight process is meant to bring out different outcomes that could happen. And so um, just that management is so important. But then secondly, moving on to the second stage, as a facilitator, once you have the people in the room, um, is, is also to, to, of course, have done your homework beforehand to understand what the, the power politics are. And usually it's not just women who are excluded. Sometimes you have, of course, people with disability and so forth, uh, or people with lesser education. So you have a room with a professor and a, and a room with a young person. And that, that power distance is so, so big that, um, for example, the younger person will not speak, speak because, first of all, culture dictates that they don't, um, they, they have nothing better to say than the professor. So as a facilitator, you have to manage the process by right from the beginning, disarming the all that uh, all those titles and all those um you know um managing that power distance through how you facilitate so one of the processes i use for example is to ask people to write their titles down and i hold that a dustbin and i ask everybody to put it down to to put the the their titles in the dustbin and i say from the beginning um it means that all of us are are are, are don't have those titles the second thing is that i don't use people's names i use for example a symbol um, like um, a fruit. So all of us have picked a different fruit that we would like to use. And in that sense, it's just simple ways of managing those that power distance. And and through that process, it, it, it can be difficult. And sometimes it can be, if you have a member of parliament in the room, it can feel demeaning for them. But depending on how you, you sort of like facilitate the process as a, um, you can actually make it fun and make them sort of like disarm that level of self-importance not just for MPs, but also, let's say, bring up the women um, to that level where you want them to engage and so forth. So how you facilitate the process, making sure everybody feels included and their opinion is important, is a very important process. And then also um, understanding that a foresight process is about um, um, bringing people into a room, in a sense, who never come into that room, so that all those self-interests, you have an opportunity to address them in that room. So first of all, approaching the process of foresight as, as story building helps it to, to come away from the vested interests that people have with all these um, issues about my issue is important than the other issue. And in a sense, treating it as a story, treating it as everybody else's story is as important as mine. And that has helped a lot in terms of managing those power distances and helping everybody feel included. And in the end, whether it's the self-important person or the, the youngest person in the room or the person who feels less important, everybody leaves the room at the end of the workshop feeling that they have learned from each other. And also remember that we are moving from the known to the unknown. And the equalizing factor is here that when we all get to the point of the unknown where we have the, the stories, everybody feels like they have taken a journey and that journey equalizes all of us. And that has been my experience in terms of trying to manage the power distance. I'd uh, like to hand over the microphone as a wrap up uh, to uh, Bunmi. Bunmi, can I have um, 60 seconds uh, wrap up uh, from you? Uh, your takeaway messages uh, to the audience. Uh, go ahead, Bunmi. Bunmi, can you, uh, can you unmute, please? Thank you to everyone for joining the webinar. Um, I hope you've been able to um, uh, take um, one or two things, important um, messages away from um, from the engage uh, from the engagement of the speakers. Um, I think for me, uh, from any everything that has been said, uh, we've been able to address um, some of the key questions in uh, basically how do we engage um, local communities and foresight and um, help them to um, uh, to be able to um, use foresight to address their, some some of their pressing and long-term issues. Um, 
Also, one of the things that uh, we're trying to address also is uh, the power the issue of power and power relations. Um, um, Tanja made a, a good point about that. Robin was trying to make one, but maybe I could add to what he said from um, some of the thing, uh, 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 foresight uh, uh, initiative. In. He basically uh, trying to, uh, for, uh, from the process, like Katindi said, trying to understand who and who are meant to be part of the process. And one of the key issues also in, um, in managing the processes is also um, setting some grand rules during the foresight work to en ensure that you understand what each individual member of the, uh, of the foresight workshop is bringing to the table in terms of experience and uh, uh, and, and, and outlook also, and to lay some ground rules that enable in each individual to be able to make contributions. One of the things we usually do also sometimes is when there is a lack of agreement is to set up like rule, like maybe two third rule where two third members of the workshop have to vote and to build consensus also. So that at that level, um, the power, power and power relations are, are, are a lot well managed. So I think Katindi uh, made a very good point also. I was hoping Robin would be able to make a good point in that, but uh, unfortunately his internet uh, condition was, uh, his connection was very bad. So um, I think um, to a large extent, um, yeah, we, um, the speakers have been able to address so many of our key questions. Uh, I'm going to say thank you to all of them. And uh, uh, like uh, uh, Peter mentioned in the beginning, uh, uh, the uh, out output of this, available for people to um, um, uh, to follow up with and to re, uh, to download or to have access to later to be able to uh, uh, to engage with and for many people who may have other questions uh, we look forward to for, uh, further engagement also so I think that's all for me for now okay very good uh, Bunmi. thank you very much uh, by this I would also like to uh, to thank Tanya Katindi and uh, Robin <laughs> with his connectivity challenges uh, today um, again also thank you to Emmy for the technical management and all of you for participating in this webinar in the um, next days you will get a mail from me with a link to the uh, recording of the webinar and the link to the presentation file uh, which we can uh, which we have used in this webinar we will aggregate the rest of the questions which were left uh, unanswered with the presenters and uh, will aggregate the answers in a follow-up email uh, to you in the next uh, coming uh, week. Uh, by this, I would like to thank you again for uh, participating and persisting in this uh, webinar, uh, your engagement um, and your active participation. And I'm looking forward to uh, see you guys again in the uh, webinars that we have scheduled um, uh, after the summer. Um, I will um, email all of you um, the schedule for the next uh, webinars, and I'm looking forward uh, to see you as of September again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, thank you, Katindi. Thank you, uh, Robin. Thank you, uh, Emi uh, and Bunmi. Uh, we'll see you again after the summer. Thank you very much. Good night and good evening and good afternoon.